First Thessalonians. We began last week in this book, and God willing, we'll go through um, every verse of this letter and go into Second Thessalonians. We uh, had a good introduction last week of who wrote this letter. Uh, it was the Apostle Paul and um, some of his compadres, Silas and Timothy. They wrote uh, from the city of Corinth to a new church, a very young church. Uh, in the book of Acts chapter 17, uh, we have the account of Paul going to this, uh, to this city, which was a very populated area, very, um, you know, it was a happening city at that time, had a population of about 200,000. The letter was written uh, somewhere around 49 AD, and the Apostle Paul wrote to them uh, to begin answering some questions, correct a little bit of their doctrine that they would be more firmly established in the faith. He, he sent Timothy to them to check on them. And Acts 17 says that he preached there for three Sabbaths. So he was there for about 21 days or about three weeks and the church was born. And Timothy went to check on them and Timothy comes back with this great report that this, this brand new church, these new believers, we're doing fantastic. And so he begins his letter with a disposition of thanksgiving. He was, he was extremely thankful for this church and he was thankful to God because it was only by God that this church was born and continued to thrive in the midst of great persecution and he only was there for three weeks with them. So follow along with me Verse 1, again, even though we read this last week, follow along with me. Paul, Salvanius, also Silas, it's different, you know, same name, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God, true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What a great opening chapter. Last week we focused on mainly verses 2 and 3. On how these new believers had had a reputation that exploded from where they were all through the area. In fact, he says, your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. They had a reputation. They had turned from their idols to serve the one true God. This was an amazing event that took place. And, and Paul was thankful to God for this. He says, I constantly mentioning you in our prayers. And last week we focused that, that they had had a work of faith. 
Their works of turning from idols to serve God proved their faith. It was a proving faith. It was a faith that, that they held on to. A good example of this is not just belief in something. Let me give you an example. So a parachute. You can believe that a parachute exists. If you're on an airplane, the airplane's going down. It's going to crash. And somebody says, hey, there's a parachute. And you can look at the parachute and you say, yes, I believe that's a parachute. Does you no good. The plane crashes, you die. This is why in James he says, you believe in God. And you think that's good. Well, yeah, the demons also believe in God, but yet they shudder. You see, this belief, the saving faith of belief is a trust, a wholehearted trusting. So you believe that's a parachute, but until you put that parachute on and jump out of the plane and pull the cord, belief is not saving faith. So he says a work of faith. The example you know that's a parachute, you know you're going to crash, so you put it on and you jump out of the plane because you know this is the only thing that will save you. That's the work of faith. Then he says your labor of love and your steadfastness in hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We focused last week on that. I encourage you to go back, listen to that sermon. So that was the first thing that Paul gave thanks to God for. He gave thanks to God for their work of faith, their labor of love, and the steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus. The second reason that Paul gives thanks to God for his readers, those who are in God, the church of the Thessalonians, is because he knows of their election by God. His knowledge of their election is based on the transformation that took place in their lives. He says, knowing your election, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, it's after the statement of their work, their labor, and steadfastness. Why is that important to understand? As I read this, verse 4, we can't just skip over that quickly. I need to spend some time today and explain a little bit about what Paul was writing to these Thessalonians. Read with me. Verse 4. We know. Okay, that's certain. We know, brothers, loved by God. The word brothers there is the, the same effectual word that Paul often uses, the word brethren. It's speaking of the church. It's an effectual word of a, of a family. We know brothers loved by God that He has chosen you. Now, if anybody is a serious Bible student, and read the Bible, you will ultimately come across some of these words by God of chosen, election, predestined. These words are put there by God for a purpose. They cannot just be skipped over. They cannot just be rationalized. We need to know what God has to say for his people. And so Paul says this to to the Thessalonians, this brand new baby church, infant of a church that had monstrous, just exuberant evidence of their faith throughout Macedonia and everywhere. Paul's saying, you guys are amazing me. What you have done so far just blows me away. It makes me constantly thank God for you. Thank God for your work. Thank God for the fruit that's being produced. It's it's not you. I know it's Him. See, Paul can relate with this. Paul called himself the chief of sinners. Paul says, I was a persecutor of the church, but God chose me to be an instrument unto the Gentiles. They were loved by God, these Thessalonians. You see, we have an account in Acts chapter 16, verse 9, of God giving Paul a vision, a dream. 
to go specifically to Thessalonica to preach the gospel because God had some of his sheep there. You see, God chose the Thessalonians. It's clear. He didn't, he didn't use a different word. He used the word chosen. We know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. He sent Paul a vision specifically to go. He didn't send a vision somewhere else. He sent it specifically to the Thessalonians. Now, God loved them before time even began. Before He said, let there be light. God loved them. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. Write those down. Go back. Study those verses. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 says, chosen before the foundation of the world. Now, a lot of times people, they don't really understand why? Because they constantly will have the perspective of man looking back towards God. And it's very difficult to, to, to rationalize or use logic in some of these situations. I'm going to do my best today to introduce some of this. This will not be an exhaustive study on the doctrine of election, but it will be an introduction. And so what I'm going to give you is some tools that I want you to go I want you to open up your Bibles. I want you to consider the things that I have taught you today. And I want you to get with God. And He will show you the truth. The Holy Spirit will guide you in the truth. How do I know that? The Bible says that. That is part of the beauty of the God, Holy Spirit. He teaches you truth. Now, God handpicked them. He handpicked them. How do I know that? Because the word chosen. The word chosen in Greek is ek longe. Ek means out of. The longe is a deliberate selection. It is the act of picking out. If you take a bowl of purple Skittles, you have 5,000 of them in there, okay? They're all in the bowl. If I go and I choose for myself 50 out of that 5,000, I would have done that word, eklonge. I would have chosen some out of the bowl of Skittles for myself. That's the word. I didn't choose all 5,000 of them because that would not be eklonge. That would not be a specific selection, a deliberate choice on my part which is free from any outside influence. Nothing, the bowl, the skittles, nothing influenced my sovereign choice of the 50 skittles that I chose. That's the word eklonge. It is a deliberate picking, a deliberate action of selection. This word is used throughout the New Testament. And we're going to get into some of the examples of that. Now, the three things that we get from verse 4 so far is, number one, that God loved the Thessalonians. He loved these people. Why do we, how do we know that? Well, it says that. Brothers loved by God. Agape. Agape. This isn't a brotherly love. This isn't, I love hot dogs. This is, I love you with an effectual love that's un. Influenced, meaning nothing in all creation can separate you from the love that God has for you in Christ Jesus. Nothing in all creation, no sin, nor death, nor height, nor, you know, He loved these people. We know that. We also know that God handpicked them because of the word, eklonge. He handpicked them. He also sent a vision to Paul specifically that he would go and preach to them. And we also know that the power of the gospel is demonstrated, okay? Because Paul says, we did not just come to you in word. We didn't come and preach the gospel and it just landed flat on the ground. It had evidence. It had power. It had something happened. It was a match, a catalyst that started something. Paul came with the gospel. What is that? 
You Thessalonians who are pagan, who don't know nothing about nothing. There was a man who was born of a virgin. He came and lived a sinless life. He's from Israel. He does not believe in anything but the mono God, the one and only true God of Israel. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Messiah. He was prophesied in the Old Testament, and every one of those prophecies came true. He was born in Bethlehem, and he was arrested As a criminal with no evidence, put on a cross, God had him condemned so that sin, your sin, would be condemned in him. Your life would be imputed on that cross. His life of perfection would be imputed to you. You believe that you have eternal life. That is a scandal. Nobody would believe that unless it was the power of God. And that's what happened. Three weeks, boom. It says in Acts chapter 17, some believed Paul. And they became little sheep loved by God. You see, John 10, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. They hear me. They hear me. I know them by name. They hear the truth of the gospel. Their ears hear it. Blessed is he who have ears to hear. Where's that come from, Isaiah chapter 6? Where God tells Isaiah, the multitudes won't hear. They don't have ears to hear. They don't want to hear. God sent them, Paul. The gospel was proclaimed, and he says it came with power, demonstrating power. Where do we get that from? Well, verse 5, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. These people repented of their sin, which means that they had a different life, which means that these people were regenerated. They were a new creation. Their desires changed. Now, if we have this in the Bible, and there's multiple examples of this, why would we think That to be a Christian just means that you say you believe in Jesus, but yet you live as if you don't believe or follow Jesus. You still do everything and participate in the world. Your main priority is money. Your main priority is pleasure, not serving Christ. That's not the way of these Thessalonians. It says that full conviction came upon them. That they had turned from their idols to serve the living God. That their reputation was known. Does anyone know where you work or where you go to school or wherever you do anything? Do any of your neighbors know you're a follower of Jesus and would say that that evidence is known? Well, the Thessalonians did. That's for sure. So, those three things. They were loved by God. God handpicked them. And the power of the gospel was demonstrated with full conviction. And the process of sanctification begins. It's a beautiful thing. It's a rebirth. Anybody ever heard that? John chapter 3, unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't even see it. You don't know it. This is why when you're around non-believers that have never experienced a rebirth, they think something's wrong with you. You're weird. You're one of those freaks. You know? Uh, Javen, my little sweet little boy, he came home from the bus last week. We're sitting on the couch. And I'm trying to do this new thing instead of saying, how was your day? Because what do I get? Fine. You know? So I got this thing off the internet where it's like 50 questions that you can ask them, like, what made you smile today? What is something that made you sad? You know, so I I asked him this question. He said, Dad, so I was there on the playground, and I was talking to everybody about Jesus, and someone said to me, you talk about Jesus too much. And he goes, Dad, can, can I talk about Jesus too much? And I go... No, no, no. I mean, you're asking me. I mean, ask somebody else. They might say yes, but no. You keep talking about Jesus because one day one kid, one sheep 
who's chosen by God will hear and be safe. And be saved. Now, chosen throughout Scripture, okay? We have evidence that he chose those Thessalonians. Does, does God have a pattern of doing this? Does God, do we have any ever, uh, other evidence in Scripture of God choosing and the answer to that is yes. It's all throughout the Bible. Well, let's start with Adam and Eve. Was that by chance? Did God not name them? Did God not create Eve out of Adam? Yes. Now, did Adam and Eve take God by surprise? Did God roll the dice and say, Bram, let's, let's just see how this turns out? Did God not know that they were going to choose to obey Satan rather than them, him? Look, God never learned nothing. It, nothing takes God by surprise. That's part of who he is. He exists in a realm outside of logic. God is. And he knows everything. Adam and Eve. Who else? What about Noah? Did God not choose Noah? Does the Bible not say, for Noah found favor with God? In the Hebrew, that word favor, guess what? It is translated in Greek is the word grace. God, he, Noah found favor with God. Was it because Noah was, was just this righteous person? <gasps> gotcha. The Bible says he was. It says he was righteous. But what does our mind think righteous means? That he was perfect? Was Noah perfect? No. One perfect, and that's Christ. Noah was not perfect. So, well, why, why did Noah? Why did Noah find favor with God? What about the rest of those people? The, the scholars estimate about six billion people on earth. Six billion, that's a lot of folks. Noah preached for 120 years a message of repentance. 120 years. One day it started to rain. Eight people got on that boat. Eight people. It says God shut them in. You know what happened to the rest of the people? Annihilated by God's wrath. Now, why did those eight people get to go on the boat? I don't know. Other than the fact that God chose them. The Bible says that in Genesis chapter 6. It's a fact. Noah was not sinless. As soon as he got up out of that boat, he went and got drunk as a skunk, passed out naked in front of his daughters. He was not sinless. But God chose him for a purpose. And he chose the others within his family. Eight people. Who else? What about the nation of Israel? Okay? We got this guy, Abram. Abram grew up in a family. His dad's name means moon worshiper. Moon worshiper. You know what Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 7 says? Write it down and go read it. It says, God chose Abram. God chose him. Changed his name. God did that. Abraham didn't do that. Changed his name to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. God did that. God chose the nation of Israel. He did not choose the Philistines or the Moabites or the Hittites or the Shittites or whatever. He chose the nation of Israel. Read with me. Deuteronomy chapter 7, 6 through 8. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Holy didn't mean that they were perfect. Holy meant that they were separate, that they were unique. They were unique among all the other nations. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now, that sounds like Eklonge. He has a bowl full of Skittles. 
bowl full of people, all of creation, and God handpicked some out. That's what it says. For God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who were on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than the other people that the Lord has set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. This speaks again to God's sovereign choice that he set his love on the nation of Israel. Started with Abram, a moon worshiper. He set his love, and he says it wasn't because you were some great nation. It wasn't because you outnumbered everybody or you're something special. He just decided because he's God, and he can do that. Romans chapter 9, who are you, old man, to talk back to God and say to the potter, you, you can't do this. Oh, yes, he can. He is the great almighty God who can do as he wishes. And everything he does, everything he chooses is right and perfect. Now, read with me Romans chapter 9, verse 11 through 13. I'll wait till you get there. Flip to the New Testament. When you're at Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 11, say amen. We got a couple amens over here. Got some over here. Okay. Now, read with me. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Ek longe. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. You see, God chose Jacob. He did not choose Esau. Now, we know based upon this verse, God did not choose Jacob because Jacob was better than Esau. Jacob was a sinner. Jacob was a liar, a deceiver. He deceived his own dad. But it says that God's purpose of election might continue. He chose Jacob. For he told Abraham, you will have a son. I'm an old man. My wife, Sarai, is old. We can't have any kids. We're past that baby making error. And God says, oh no, you will have a son. From your own loins, you will bear a son. And you will be a father of a great multitude. Look at the stars, Abram. Look at the sands of the seashore, for I will make your offspring as they are. It says that Abram believed God. He didn't know how, but he believed him. He had faith, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Not any works, but by faith. The father of faith. Abraham believed God in faith, not of works. But he believed God that it was going to rain. It was going to flood the whole earth, and he built that boat just like he was told. Well, Abram decided, God's taken a long time. Maybe he's got it messed up. Maybe I just need to help him. And Sarah said, well, I've got this, this, young, this young woman in her prime. She's at the baby-making age. 
And Abram was like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. No, he was like, sign me up. Ishmael was born. Ishmael was not the promise, was not the bloodline for the Messiah, was not the bloodline of the true Israel, because Romans 9 says, for not all Israel is Israel. It is those in whom the hand of God of favor and grace have been placed upon. Isaac was born. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel by God. It means he who wrestles with God. Who did that? God did that. Jacob, who became Israel, had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. Judah, a son of Jacob, had the bloodline to lead to Jesse. Who would have David? Who would have Solomon? Even at the relationship of adultery and murder, God's redeeming grace was played through that. Who ultimately had Mary. Who had Jesus. Now, I said that this is not going to be an exhaustive study of the doctrine of election, but it will be an introduction. What are some purposes that we can get out of the Scripture? Whenever you learn about this, you must understand always to get and build your theology from the Bible. If you close your Bible and start reading all these commentaries or or referring to logic, your brain's going to get so just jumbled up. The Bible teaches and is the source of truth. The purpose of election. God chose a people to enjoy a unique relationship with Him, which entailed the privilege of belonging to Him, sharing in all of His inheritance, serving Him, praising Him, and proclaiming Him. He he says that in Deuteronomy. You will be a special people unto me. The book of Revelation I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, Ephesians chapter 1. Flip there right quick. Some have said that this chapter, Ephesians chapter 1, is some of the deepest waters of the Bible. It is a glorious chapter. It could have only been inspired by God to write such a beautiful picture of God's plan. We definitely do not have time to camp out here today, but we will get a few things from these verses. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 4, and we're going to read through verse 6. The Apostle Paul says, Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Now, Paul here is writing to the Ephesians. And he says, chose us, which includes all Christians. So those three things that we got from the Thessalonians, that God loved them, He loves you. That God handpicked them. If you're in Christ, He handpicked you. And the gospel comes with demonstrating power of regeneration. That should be a reality in your life. Now here he says, verse 4, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of His glorious grace with which He blessed us in the Beloved. Number one we get from this, God chose. God chose. Say it again. God chose, which means He foreordained. God chose and foreordained the saints in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's mind-blowing. 
And you know what? It's a good thing. If your mind's not blown right now, just spend some time thinking about all this stuff. It should blow your mind. It should be like, wow, what? And when you start to climb that ladder of trying to, to, to figure out what do you mean, oh God, that you chose me before the foundation of the world, you don't get before one or two steps before you're flat on your face, humble before God, and you're like crying out, oh my God, in fear. Why'd you choose me and not someone else? For I am a sinner in need of grace. That's when you continue to learn that that grace has been given through Christ. That's where worship comes in. As, as Charles Spurgeon said, thank God he chose me before the foundation of the world because if he would have waited until I was born, he never would have chose me. So number one, God chose foreordained the saints in Christ before the foundation of the world. Number two, according to the good pleasure of His will. What does that mean? That means that before the foundation of the world, the triune community of the Father and the Son and the Spirit planned it out fully, always knowing the course of salvation, the course of human history, the course of time in which He would set into motion this big bang that these intellectuals talk about and have no clue what started it came from God Almighty, the only one who can take something out of nothing and make order. It was, number two, according to the good pleasure of His will. Number three, unto the adoption as sons and daughters. Adoption. Why not born into His family? Why do we have to be adopted? Because we're all sinners. We're all orphans. We're all orphans out there as sinners. As you read Ezekiel chapter 16, you write that one down. Ezekiel chapter 16, go read it. Spend some time around there where God gives this picture of the nation of Israel, a worthless nation. Gives the image of a baby that's been thrown out all bloody by a prostitute to die. Helpless. It says wallowing around in your own blood. Picture that in your mind. I know it's kind of a morbid picture, but picture a, a, an, inno an innocent little helpless baby, a, an infant that was just born. There's no way that baby would survive on its own. No way possible. And God says that. But it says God passed by and found favor on this baby. Now see, at this time it was very common for prostitutes to throw their babies out. Why? Because having babies around was a damper on their business. So not all the babies out there, but this one. This one found favor with God. And then he goes on to say on their relationship that God would raise them up as his own wife and he would put jewels on them and bless them and take him, them home. And then they would run around with other men. And that's what they did, all of their idols. And then at the end, it's beautiful when he says, but I will forgive you of all of your sins. And he says this, not because of you. I'm not doing it because you're so fantastic and great and you're so worth it. I'm doing it for my name's sake, for my glory. Now what does that mean? That means that God is honored and praised and will be for all of eternity for His righteousness. Those who will be cast into the lake of fire, as it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. God will be glorified for that. The angels in heaven will praise hallelujahs to God for His righteousness and His wrath. How do I know that? Romans chapter 9 tells me so. That He will be praised even more for those who have been given His grace to see the results of His wrath upon those who were prepared for destruction in advance. He will be praised for both. So He says in Ezekiel 16, not for your name's sake, but for my name's sake, your sins will be blotted out. 
All of them will be forgiven. You'll be washed whiter than snow. That's beautiful. Now, number five we get from Ephesians 1 through 4. Not only are we to be adopted, which means that we have to be brought into his family through Jesus Christ, as it says in John chapter 1, to all who believed and received his name, he, they were given the right to become children of God. So, he also says that this is to the praise of his glorious grace. And I just touched on that. God's forgiveness and love upon people will bring him glory and does bring him glory. And number six, he freely bestowed on us. He freely gave it to us. In Revelation 17, verse 14, the triumphant church in heaven is described as, write that down, Revelation 17, 14. Go back and read it. The triumphant church in heaven is described as the called and chosen. That's amazing, man. It's incredible. God's sovereign choice governs the experience and testing of the saints at every point from beginning to end. I don't know how to handle that. That's okay. Stay in his word. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Nevertheless, it's true. This, what I'm teaching you today, is hardly ever taught anymore in any church. Why? Because it's controversial. It's hard. It's hard to understand. It's not easy. I mean, there's some implications to that. Does that mean that he chose some and didn't choose others? That's exactly what it means. Well, then, well, then uh, how is God right in doing so? Well, let me tell you something. This is very basic. God doesn't owe you or anybody nothing. He doesn't owe salvation to nobody. So therefore, if some are born in sin against him and die and suffer in hell for all of eternity, he is righteous and good and worthy of praise. What? Yeah. You've sinned against God. You did it. He didn't do it. Well, I was born that way. Yeah, you were. That's why God told Adam, all in Adam will die, Romans chapter 4. Did you not do it with a conscience? C-O-N, with that's what it means. Prefix with. Science means knowledge. Conscience. Conscience. When you sin, you've did it with knowledge. When you have, as Jesus said, every careless word will be brought into judgment. Call your brother a fool. He is worthy of the flames of hell. That's what Jesus said. I know people say, well, that sounds like a fire-breathing preacher. No, I sound like Jesus. That's what he said. I didn't say it. He said it. Don't be afraid of the man who can kill your body. No, I tell you who to be afraid of, the one who can kill your body and cast your soul into hell. So therefore, God, God is not in just anyone. In fact, he owes grace and his love and mercy to no one. But he gave. And here's a beauty thought that I want you to hold on to. Jesus said this. Whoever wills may come. Whoever is heavy laden and burdened can come unto me and I will give them rest. Now Jesus said that. He also said this, unless the Father enables you, you cannot come. Two sides of the same coin. What does he call all men to do? Mark chapter 16. Repent. Every one of you and believe in the gospel. See, we're not told to figure out whether or not you're chosen or not. And I'm, I'm tired of sitting people, well, maybe I'm not chosen. Hey, buddy or sister, the only thing that's holding you back is you. Well, what if the Father hasn't enabled me? Look, you're told to repent and believe the gospel. Run to Jesus. What's holding you back? You're holding you back. Your sin. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. All may come unto me, but you won't come to me. That's what he told Isaiah. You're going to go out there and you're going to preach, and not one person's going to believe you. Why? Because they don't have ears to hear or eyes to see. They'll always be hearing but not perceiving. Why? Because man is desperately wicked and deceitful. 
It says the human heart is more desperately wicked and deceitful than all things. So what do you do with that? Number one, if you're a Christian, Romans 8 says it's his spirit that testifies with your spirit that you're his child. So what do you do with that? You rejoice and you realize this, that God handpicked you. God chose you. Listen to this. There was a boy. This boy did not have much athletic ability at all. He was scrawny. He had no talent. Every time he and his friends would play some game, he was always the last one to be chosen. One day, two fellows came to play with them and were allowed to be team captains because they were older. The first team captain chose the boy who was always chosen last. Why? Because they were brothers. And he loved his brother. So it is with God. He chose us not because of our abilities, but because he loves you. That was as a personal, uh, let you a little bit into my life, that has always been, since being a Christian, the hardest thing for me to accept is God's love. Sometimes that comes out in my preaching. There's been times my, my preaching is unbalanced because I know the seriousness of sin. I've seen it right in the face. And I know how much Satan hates you, and I know how much he hates me. So it is a serious thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews says. It should be preached. It should be taught. But the love of God is so amazing, so beyond my comprehension that he would choose me. See, I know how wicked I am. There ain't no doubt in my mind. No, I don't have to sit here and wrestle with my own righteousness. No, I am a sinner in deserving of his wrath. He is so perfect and lovely and beautiful and amazing. And sometimes the things that I do drag his name through the mud and I'm broken hearted over that. But to know that he dances over me when I'm unaware is incredible. Now, Jesus told his disciples, you didn't choose me. And you've got to understand that. You see, John chapter 15, verse 16 through 17, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in the Father's name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Jesus says, you did not choose me. You hear someone saying, man, I sure am glad I had the sense to choose Jesus. You got it all wrong, buddy. You're not even reading your Bible. You hadn't even got, you're still drinking milk. You did not have the sense to choose Jesus. Your sinful heart, you would have continued to be the, the, the soil that is full of rocks. You see, the Bible teaches that the things of God are spiritually discerned. The natural mind cannot comprehend these things. So if you've learned anything of God, it's because God's grace has come upon you. Now, Matthew 22, verse 14. Very, very important verse to know in your heart and understand and hold on to. Matthew 22, verse 14. Look what it says. For many are called. The gospel is a free call to all men. Every man or woman, the gospel call is free. But what did Jesus say? For many are called, but few are chosen. For many are called, but few are chosen. I don't know about you, but that's a serious verse. The grace of God the called of God, the chosen of God, the elect of God. You see, what that's for is to guarantee that there's no boasting in heaven at all. That is in Revelation when it says that He gives us these crowns, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of the gospel. There's lots of rewards that will be given unto heaven. What does it say? We will cast them at His feet. For we realize that everything good that we've ever done is in Him. Paul constantly said the same thing. 
Paul was, a, I mean, just a giant of the faith, and he constantly said, it's not me, it's him. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31, for considering your calling, again, your calling, you were called by God. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards, not many powerful or noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is low and despised in the world. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now we're going to end with this. We're going to end with this one. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Do you live your life in such a way as that? Do you see yourself as a royal priest? Do you see this church as a royal priesthood unto God to serve Him as a chosen race? These aren't just words. These are the words of Almighty God, a holy nation, a people for His own possession. You are. Not high and mighty, not born of noble birth, chosen of God before the foundation of the world, that you what? May proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. The Bible says you were dead in your transgressions. You were dead in sin. But He, right? But He who loved us made us alive. He did it. Lazarus, dead in that tomb, could have never come out unless life was imputed to him for him to hear the call of Jesus, come forth. So if you have ears to hear today, I ask you, I plead with you, number one, accept the love that God has given you based upon his declaration of that love. Number two, live your life as a chosen race, a royal priesthood this church is, according to God's word, and for what? that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him. Have you proclaimed the excellencies of God to anyone? We're told here, we are to do that, not the motivation that we will become out of darkness or that we will be given salvation or that we'll be given a rebirth. No, we do it because He's already called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. And when you've seen that, the glories of the grace of the gospel had nothing to do with you. It was all Him from the foundation of the world. Your, your acceptance of Jesus came from the grace of God. Your only response is humility, love, and proclamation of that God never tells us to try to figure out who the elect are, ever. He says this, and go home with this, you preach the gospel to every creature. You let him figure out who's elect. That's his list anyway. It's him who knows sovereignly who is his and who is not. He tells you to be the instruments of his witness. And that witness goes on to those who will be saved, those who won't be saved. It don't matter. It's all him. You are to proclaim the consistent truth Repent, all men, and believe the gospel. Let's pray.